Good, good. Right, though, so um, for those of you that don't recognise me wearing this, I'm John Bailey. Um, so I'm a member of the congregation. I thought I'd better smarten up today a little bit. So um, uh, I hope you still recognise me. So um, today we're going to um, talk about remembering hope. So today is about remembrance and remembering those who've sacrificed. Um, but I think I also wanted to sort of point us today towards the hope that they had um, when they were fighting um, and when they were trying to secure freedom uh, for the future generations. So if we could go to the first slide, please, Luke. This, uh, unbelievably, uh, is my grandmother. So she was born in 1899. Um, and I like to think probably about this age, uh, this is when she would have heard the tragic news that her brother John had been killed in action or was missing in action um, in April... 2000, in April 1918, so she would have been about 19 when she would have heard that her brother wasn't coming home from the First World War. Um, she had an embroidery on a trinket box saying 1918, which I believe was uh, sent by her brother um, from the trenches, and she treasured that for her whole life. And so the First World War, in some sense, when I was a child, felt quite real to me, because we would ask my grandmother, what was... What's that embroidery for? What's that? And she would tell us about her brother. Now, if you can just skip to the next slide, please. This is my dad, okay? And uh, he was 55 when I was born, so um, he, he fought in the Second World War. So he signed up at the start of the Second World War. Um, he ended up being a major, um, and we have no idea what he did. He did not speak about the war once during my entire life, my entire childhood. And I only found this photo about five years ago when my mum died, so we knew nothing of this at all. We just knew he was in the, in the services. Um, so we've obtained his war record now. It looks like he was doing something a bit secret, and that might be why he didn't tell us anything, but we have no idea what he did. So there was two, you know, in my family growing up, there were two different responses to war and remembering war. And uh, so it, does, it has some resonance for me today um, when we talk about Remembrance Sunday and we think about our family and we think about the impact that war had on those families and many others. And I'm sure you all have stories from your, your families as well. Um, and it was great to hear about Katie's uh, granddad as well there and see all, the, see all the mementos. But unfortunately, I don't have any of those and that's, that's actually a sadness to me. So... Um, but there we are, That's for everyone is different and everyone reacts in different ways. But today what I want to do is say, as we remember those people, um, I wanted to remember what they were fighting for and the hope that they wanted um, to have um, for, for a better future. So um, today is Remembrance Sunday, it's always on the second Sunday in November, and um, that is linked to the ending of the First World War when the guns fell silent at 11 o'clock on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. And I hadn't realised that the reason the service now is in the centre of every second Sunday is because in the, in the Second World War, they actually decided they weren't going to have the remembrance service on a weekday because that would stop the factories um, from creating armaments for the Second World War. So actually it's always now been moved to the second Sunday rather than on a work day. So there we are, now you know, that's exciting. Um, right, okay, so my inspiration for today came from, the, if you show the next slide, please. Um, the, this is called the Kohima Epitaph, and it was written by um, uh, a code breaker at the end of the First World War, and it's been used by the uh, Royal Burma um, Legion, uh, Burma Association, and um, it's named after a battle place um, in Burma. And it says, when you go home, Tell them of us and say for your tomorrow we gave our today. So I say, when you go home, tell them of us and say for your tomorrow that we gave our today. And um, I, I found that really powerful epitaph because um, it not only remembers those, you can imagine people telling their colleagues, if, if you're going home, please tell people this, but it has a future hope and a future focus on it. And so as I was trying to find a passage um, to go through today, I wanted to find a passage that not only remembered the past and remembered the horrors of war, but also gave a hope for the future and uh, encouragement for us as we, uh, as we look forward. And you know, this, this week, I think a lot of us have felt a little bit of hope disappearing when we've seen what's been happening in 
the American elections. It felt like quite a world-changing week. So hopefully it's a well-timed message about the hope we have for the future. Um, so let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. I'm, I'll read Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 5. It's on page, if I get my glasses on, 687 of your church Bibles. So it's Isaiah chapter 2, 1 to 5. So this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So, um, Prophet Isaiah lived in a time um, when uh, the, the city where he lived in Jerusalem was full of corruption. There was injustice, there was um, false trading, and God absolutely despised all of that corruption and that injustice. Um, and so um, what, was, what was happening was that God gave messages to Isaiah to try and tell the people to um, restore that justice, restore that, um, that hope, and restore God's, God's kingdom where they, were, where they were living. But um, the people were rebellious and they didn't listen to God and they didn't listen to prophets like Isaiah who, gave God, who had God's message um, and they continued to be corrupt. And so God had to judge them. And he judged them by sending the local military superpower of the Assyrians to come and attack them and later the Babylonians as well. Um, and so at this time Isaiah was writing, there would have been a uh, military threat, there would have been wars, there would have been many of the things that we're remembering today. So this message is a message that comes at a time of conflict and at a time of struggle. And so it's amazing to see the hope in this message that, that we have today. So Isaiah was offering out this, this vision of hope, this vision of a future when there's no war, there's no more need for um, suffering and shame. And, there, and God will bring this peace and the, the word for, in the Bible for peace is shalom, and it's not just about the absence of war, the guns going quiet. This peace is about everything being restored back to the way it should be, everything being set in its right order, and everything being good. So it's not just the absence of something. This is a very positive peace. It's a, complete, a completeness and a wholeness, and it brings back a picture of um, the Garden of Eden where everything was great before we had sin. So if you remember that, remember that picture here that Isaiah is holding out this image in this time of war and this time of struggle, this time of conflict, this time of corruption and injustice. And he's saying that there's going to be this great peace that will come. And Isaiah, if you read through Isaiah, Isaiah is packed full of references 700 years before Jesus came of this, of this saviour who was going to come and who was going to bring this new kingdom. And we've heard so much about that as uh, Chris has been taking us through the book of Mark and Mike as well, I think, and, and me. Um, and um, we hear about God's kingdom coming and that's what Isaiah is talking about in, in this passage. So I'm just going to go through very quickly in this passage. There's sort of four, four points to make. I'm going to make them very, very fast. Um, but what I want us to do as we go talk about remembrance today is that I want us to remember this hope, this hope that Isaiah was offering out and this future that Isaiah was offering out. Um, and what we'll see is this peace will come um, through God uh, restoring all things, bringing that shalom and helping people so they no longer fight and they, know, and they will disarm and there will be a time of peace. So let us first of all just say let's, um, let's look at remembering, remembering hope. So as I said, I feel, I feel this week's been a week when our emotions have been up and down. Many of us have struggled um, and it's been hard to be hopeful. Sometimes this week I felt quite confused and, and certainly a sense of chaos. Um, so just looking back here and thinking, you know, what's our, what's our history? Um, I've talked about ancient history with my, my dad and my, my, my grandmother. 
But um, our history really is at the end of the 20th century, it was the most murderous um, decade or most day, murderous century in history. They reckon that about 187 million people were killed in war. And if you take the world population at the start of World War I, that's about 10% of the world population that's been wiped out in wars in the 20th century. And um, I was reading an article, say, at the turn of the century, and, and, and a historian was talking about what's going to happen in the 21st century. Surely it's going to get better. And he said, the 21st century is not likely to be as murderous as the 20th, but armed violence creating disproportionate suffering and loss will remain omnipresent and endemic, occasionally epidemic, in a large part of the world. The prospect of peace in our new century is remote. And I think that historian's got it bang on. So things are going to keep going in the way that they're going because of the nature of our human hearts and the way, we, the, the way that we are. And we need help. And we need to remember where that help comes from. And that help comes from God and this Messiah, this, um, this new king who Isaiah is talking about in his, uh, in his message. So I'd thoroughly recommend reading through Isaiah if you want some hope. Read through about this, this um, Jesus is going to come 700 years in the future and then we can see what he does and how he starts to bring in his peace and his kingdom. So what we'll see, if we look at verse 2 and 3, it tells us that peace is... If we flip back one side, please, that's my last slide. Uh, so if you just go back one side, please, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll stay on this one for a, a little longer. Okay, so um, first of all, we're saying verse, verse 2 and 3, what we see here is, is a talk about a temple... Um, on, the mount, on the mountain of the Lord. And this is going to be a place where people will be able to rush and gather and where peace will be established. So that's my favourite mountain in the world. That's called Mount Triglav. That's in Slovenia. And um, what you see is it's got three peaks. And I thought this was a good, um, a good mountain to share with you um, because this, this passage is talking about God's temple being on the highest of all the mountains. It will be exalted above all the hills and all the nations will stream to it. So in the Bible, a temple, um, I don't know if you like maths, but a temple is a bit like a cosmic Venn diagram. It's a place where um, heaven meets earth, and there's a crossover between heaven and earth. And that's in a spiritual sense, but also with these mountains being very high. The temple's obviously got to be as high as possible so it can be as near as possible to, to God. So if you've got a temple on a really, really high mountain, that's a place where God and people can both be and where, where heaven and earth overlap. So it's a holy place where God will meet with human beings and he'll dwell with them. And the fact that this mountain is so tall, everybody from all around the world will be able to see it. Not, the peop not only the people who live near the mountain in Jerusalem, but people who live all around the world. They'll see this amazing temple because it's on the highest hill, and they say, wow, the God that lives on that temple must be much better than our gods who live on lower hills. So let's go to the temple of God. He must be the best God that there is. And what these people will discover is that when they go to this temple with this amazing God in, they will, they will be redeemed. They will, they will want to stop fighting. They will be healed and their nations will be healed. And everybody will see that there will be a, 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 a stopping of war. And um, that they will see that as they gather together, um, God will bring them peace and he will bring this shalom that, that he promises. So first of all, that's the first image that Isaiah has of this temple high on a hill. And that might be a strange image to us. But again, it brings back images of Eden, which Garden of Eden was on a hill and it was high up. So it was a crossover between heaven and earth. So what we'll see then, verse 3 and 4, it says that when people come... Uh, they say, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. He will teach us his ways so we can walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So when people come to God's temple and they gather together in God's temple, they will hear God's law and they will know that God, what God teaches, what God demands of us is the right thing. And that if we follow God's laws and we follow his ways, then that will bring peace and it will bring end to war. And all these conflicts that seem so intractable. I mean, I've been out in the Balkans a couple of times this year and you hear the history and uh, the reason that people are fighting is because so-and-so did something in 1312 and they've taken our land and we want our land back. And, you know, there's, there's so many things that have happened over hundreds of years that we're fighting about, which we're trying to correct these historical wrongs. And um, there's no reason. All that disappears 
because we're there and we will serve God and we'll hear his law, and we'll hear his goodness and we will know him as God and then the reason to fight war will disappear. And so then again, that's what we want to do is to encourage people to say, well, where can you hear the word of the Lord? And that's what we're going to come on to in a minute. So you get this amazing picture that when people hear the word of the Lord and they obey the word of the Lord, which is what Isaiah is encouraging his people to do um, with this prophecy, he says, God will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. And isn't that a vision and a hope that we want today on Remembrance Day as we remember that's the vision of hope that we want for our future as a world. So finally then we get this, this verse here. It says, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And so that's the encouragement for, um, of Isaiah to the people of Jerusalem and the people in Judah. And it's his encouragement to us now that what we should do is live in the light of the Lord and if we live in the light of the Lord, if we live the way that God asks us to do, he, the way that his law says, um, something amazing is going to happen. So Joseph, if you could just skip on to the, the next slide, please. That if we recognize what God is calling us to do, if we want to live God's way, if we want to put down our weapons and put our, put our arms down, um, we should be living that way now. We should just be hoping that that happens in the future. The way that we bring in the future almost is that we, if we live out that future now, if we live out the fact that we trust God, if we live out the fact that we believe his law is perfect and wonderful, if we live out the fact that we, that we believe his peace is an everlasting and amazing peace brought in by Jesus, we should be living that way now. And that's our call um, as a church today, is that as we remember, as we look uh, um, all of these things, we, are, we should be encouraged that what we want to do is to live in a way that brings hope. But my suggestion today as I close is also not that we should just talk about that hope, but we should be that hope and we should do that hope. So because we are Christians, because we believe in the kingdom, um, our work here in the church should be seeking to bring that kingdom of God now as we go about our work, as we love people, as we serve Jesus, um, and as we search for peace um, both in our lives and the lives of those around us, and we can advocate for peace um, as well. So I think really that's what I wanted to encourage us today. Let's just take this final verse. It says, Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So um, the encouragement today is to try and walk in the light of the Lord, to follow God's law, to follow God's way, to be his advocates, and to try and do that hope and be that hope for the world that the world so desperately needs. So I'll just pause for a minute and then we can um, perhaps just uh, have our own remembrance for a second and then I'll, I'll pray to close. When you go home, tell them of us and say for your tomorrow that we gave our today. Lord God, we remember today those who gave their lives or who were wounded and injured um, in all the wars. Um, the First World War, the Second World War, the wars since. We thank you for the sacrifice that so many made so that we may enjoy freedom and peace. And Lord, we're sorry that our world is not a world at the moment where that freedom and peace reigns. And as we read these words um, about the end of war and the end of conflict and people coming to worship you on your mountain, Lord, there's a deep longing inside of me and um, that, that that time will come soon. Lord God, we pray for your peace, for your shalom to be established on this earth. We pray, God, that your kingdom will come. We pray, God that that time when there is no more war and no more sickness and no more fighting will come soon. And we pray, God, that as your church, Lord God, we will be able to um, share that hope, that hope of Jesus, and we may be able to be that hope to the world um, because you've sent us to the world to let them know 
about you. Amen. Amen. Right, back to you, Dave, I think. Yeah. <laughs>